Bible study today as we study the book of Exodus chapter 31. Last week we had Exodus 30, the second part, and it was worth our while. What you will notice last week, if there was a theme that ran through, was that Exodus chapter 30 was about spiritual worship. Both the one who's the worshiper or the priest and the articles of worship and how they ought to be cared for and how in what condition God expects them. The big focus last week was on a few things. All in Exodus chapter 30 was on the condition of the priest, it was on the incense, the altar of incense, it was on the ransom for the sense for rans for censors, and then we had the lava basin and the we had the bronze lava or the bronze basin, and of course we had the incense itself so today we are going to move on quickly to exodus chapter 31 it's 18 verses so we should be able to um we 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 are going to be looking at exodus chapter 31 i, I beg your pardon i'm sorry i was distracted for a bit and we're going to be is 18 verses so we should be able to finish the chapter today. I've titled today's class the the call the gift and the rest. When you look at Exodus chapter thirty one, it is so loaded, in, especially the first um, the first six verses is so rich that um, I just kept itching to do it just to come and teach it. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to come. Let us pray this evening, Father Lord, in the name of Jesus. We submit and surrender ourselves to you for the class today. We ask that your Holy Spirit will be our teacher in the name of Jesus. Let all that we will do bring glory, honor, and adoration to your name. May I not speak of myself. Let the Holy Spirit, who is the greatest teacher that there is, be our teacher this evening. And Lord, may the hearts of my men be open. May they hear your voice and may they know that which you say. May it be easy to understand and maybe even easier to apply in jesus mighty name we have prayed amen and amen and amen so exodus chapter number 31 i'll read the first six verses which is where the bulk of our content is anyway and i'll do my best to discuss it as best as i can so Exodus 31 from verse number 1, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezali, the son of Uri, the son of Hor, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom and in understanding, and in, the, and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship, to devise, to devise cunning works, to walk in gold and in silver and in brass and in brass and in cutting of stones to set them and in the carving of timber to walk in all manner of workmanship. And I behold, and I behold, I have given with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach of the tribe of Dan and in the hearts and in the hearts that of all that are wise hearted I have put wisdom that they may make all that I have commanded thee. If you remember, this was God speaking, or in Exodus, well, the main character is Moses. And this is God speaking to Moses and asking Moses, telling Moses what to do next. It was time to build the tabernacle. And um, that's the tent of worship and everything that is supposed to be inside it. 
and God decided to pick a man or God had prepared a man for this job. Last week, like I said, we concluded chapter 30 and the focus was on spiritual service and how God expected that his service be discharged. Today, we move on quickly to 31 and we see how God calls, how he equips, how he deploys and the need to incorporate rest into our work with God. In verse 1 to see, it says, see, I have called Bezali. It is interesting to note that God called Moses, yes? If you've been following our study of the book of Exodus, God called Moses. Then he called Aaron to Moses. He called Aaron to Moses. It's too high, please. He called Aaron to Moses. And then he called... All the people of Israel to follow them. Now we have moved away from Aaron. He called Aaron's sons to go with Aaron. Still too high. Anyway. Please just give me a moment. I need to sort out something. I'm sorry, I'm sweating, so I have to switch on the fan. Okay, so let me start all over. I beg your pardon. I apologize. So, Aaron, God called Moses. And if you remember in Exodus chapter 3, Moses didn't want to respond to the call. He, he kept arguing with God that he didn't know how to speak, da, 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 da. So God called Aaron. When God called Aaron, he called Aaron to be Moses' mouthpiece. Ultimately, Aaron is now become the, the high priest. And then we have Aaron's sons, then the tribe of Levi, who minister to God in different capacities in the priesthood. The point I'm trying to establish is that God we call one man, but God is always clear, is always been clear, and is always clear that one man alone cannot deliver on what it is that he wants God to do. God wants to do. So God will call other men to that man so that the vision that God has laid in the heart of the one that he called first can manifest. In this case, God called Moses and Moses' job was to transition the children of Israel or bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. In bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt, there are many things that need to be done. The children have been around Mount Sinai for a while now, and God is establishing for them the ordinances of worship. God wanted to own, for them to build a tabernacle, which would also be known as a tent of, what, of meeting, where God will come to and meet with the people. And we've been looking at this since the um, Exodus chapter 20. Yes, oh, yes, Exodus chapter 20. Now God wants the tabernacle to be built, itself to be built. And he says to a, a, a Moses, he doesn't leave... Um, he doesn't leave the responsibility of picking the person who would do the building to Moses. Instead, he said to Moses, I have called Bezali. I have called Bezali. And I looked at it. God called Moses. And when he came to building, God did not say, you and Aaron, go and figure it out. Even before the day that to build, God already um, picked a man and already resourced and equipped a man to do the work of the building. So this man's name was Bezali. The name Bezali itself means under the shadow. There was something about Bezali that made God call him. So God called Bezali and he put him in charge of what was going to be built. But I want you to see how God calls. And let me go to my notes. I say, see, I have called Bezali. God did not call Moses and Aaron alone. He called Bezali too. God called the artisans, the one who would build the tabernacle. The point is that when it comes to our journey with God, there are many parts and many moving parts to the what we call service in God. And if we would agree to work together, there are so many of us that will be called to the same vision. And if we would not be intimidated or would not be envious of each other if we will stay in the places that we have been called to stay in we would contribute our quota and the big picture will be achieved so 
in the things that God has called me to do, there are people who help me. This afternoon, someone came to see me who works with me on a factory. And I was saying to her, I have so many of you to supervise that the supervision takes so much of my time that I'm not able to produce for myself. But in, a, in, in quick succession, I followed that conversation with, but I'm grateful that I have all of you to supervise because it means that you bring your beat, I bring my beat, and ultimately the work is more rounded and we get to do more together. When God calls a man, and I need you to pay attention if he called you to leadership, if he called you to leadership, when God calls a man, he will call others to the man who will help him carry the load or carry the burden of what he's called that man to do. In the case of Moses, there, was, there were tabernacles to be built. There were acts, to be, uh, acts of the covenant to be carved and all of that. God called Bezali, a man who lived under the shadow of the Spirit of God. So the reason why God will call a man is because the man lives under his shadow. A lot of us want to be called, but it is not man who calls. Pay attention to me. It is God who calls. So even though Moses was called, when it came to building with Moses, God called the one too that he came to build, that was to build with Moses. Now, obviously, it was Moses who would now go and pick Bezali. But note that it was God who told Moses who to build, who to call so that he would build with him. As I looked at this, I thought to myself, I said, number one, no road is insignificant. God called, God called the uh, Bezali and other artisans as well. And even though they were workmen, it did not mean that they were less than Moses, insignificant. If what Moses was called to do, Moses could do. What Bezali and Aholiab and the rest of them were called to do, they could do. That's why the Bible it talks about, um, about uh, uh, calls us the body. The body is full of different parts. And in this particular situation, uh, Bezali and Aholiab were the creative geniuses that God had manifested in time so that they can do the work that God has called them to do. No role is insignificant. What it means is that without Bezali, eh, Moses would not have been able to build. And because Bezali is part of what Moses is going to do, everything will be built according to the pattern that God has called them to build. No role is insignificant. Insignificant. God didn't look for artisans or workmen outside of Moses' sphere of influence. They were right there where Moses was. But from before the foundation of the earth, God had resourced them to be the ones that will help Moses in the building of the tabernacle. Bezali, like I said, meant under the shadow. It speaks to relationship with God. As someone who needs to consistently build with teams, it is a comfort to know that God has not just called me alone to be the lone ranger that gets his work done. He has also called those who would help me build this, build whatever he's called me to build. Men who will build with me administratively. Women who will build with me different things. Last, was it last week, I, I realized that I had to create a, that we needed to create a workbook out of my book, Sister Power. So that Sister Power, the, the group, will have something to study on how to work together as women. Of course, I had someone around me who was good, who has, um, I always tell her, her brain is the best part of her, who had the capacity to do this. So I called her and I said, I know your hands are full, but is it possible that you can help me do this? And she was like, oh, you're sure, I'll help you do it. Today we had exchange voice notes and she had already started the work. What that meant was that when the workbook is done, it would, it would, enhance the work that God has called me to do, but I didn't have to do the workbook by myself. God had positioned someone within my circle of influence who had the capacity and the ability and the willingness to help me get it done. 
I needed to create a curriculum just to break down the curriculum for the train the trainer course for Purpose University. Because we want to do a train the trainer course for people who want to train children and teenagers on pop on, on the DNA of purpose, helping them discovering their purpose and putting them on the path of understanding why God put them on earth. I called another person who is in my circle of influence and has the capacity and the ability to do it. And this morning she emailed it to me. It is done already. It is such a comfort if you understand what I'm trying to say. If you are a leader, to recognize that when God calls you, he calls other people to you too. That's one side and we ought to be grateful for that. Then there is a side of the people who are called to the leader. Your work is not insignificant. Your work is not less than what it used to be, or what it ought to be. Just because Moses was in front did not mean that Aaron was less. And just because Aholiab came behind Aaron did not mean that Aaron was superior to, to Aholiab or Bezali. So God calls men and then he calls other men to the men. All because of the vision that God has put in the, lives of, in the life of or in the heart of the one that he called first. With this understanding, therefore, if I'm the leader, what I ought to be doing, and I didn't realize this until recently. What I ought to be doing is not complain and worry about who would help me build. What I ought to spend my time doing is to pray that God will open my eyes. So that I can see the ones he's put around me that he has resourced and equipped so that they can do the work. In my experience, three kinds of people are always around the leader. You need to pay attention to this if you would ever build a team. Three kinds of people are always around the leader. The first kind of people are the people that you have to train and raise. There are people who come to you, they are equipped, they are the rough around the edges, they are diamonds in the rough. Your job is to consistently work with them, to bring them to the place where they can deliver um, 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 value at, uh, to, 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 to add to the dream. Now, the reality is also, is from experience, is these ones, when you have trained them, the odds are they grow up and after a while they want to transition out. And that used to break my heart because you pour and pour and pour and pour and one day the person gets up and 80% of the time gets up with a bad attitude and just leaves. And there is no one to help you carry the work and you feel like what is the point of training these people if they will just up and leave. Then there is another set of, of people and I'm going to come back to those sets. That's first set. There is another set of people who are a blend of they are trained and they are not trained. They are resourced and partially trained. So they come to you and in the place of adding value to you, you contribute to their lives too. And they grow up and they are able to do the things that God has called them to do. Then there is a third kind of person. This third kind of person have been trained for God by God or by others. They had been called to you, but they don't get to you in, as diamonds in the rough. It takes a while. They have been trained by other people before they get to you. So when they get to you, they are ready for the work that God has called them to work with you in. So they just come and they hit the ground running. They make the contributions, very vital and valuable contributions that they should make to the vision that God has called you to. And you find that they are doing the work and you are doing the work. And these ones are usually a lot more mature and there is no rancor whatsoever. Now this thought um, group, uh, in my opinion, are the reward for the first group. This third group are the reward for the first group that you trained and left. Because if you check the history and antecedents of this third group that come to you and they're just perfect for what it is that God has called you to do, they too were trained by others over time. But it is time now and you are the one that they are serving or your vision is what they are serving with their gifts and everything that they've got. Or that God has called them to. Do you understand this so far? 
what that means is that if we go back to the first set of people that I talked about, there is nothing to, and I, let me say this to new leaders or younger leaders, do not sweat it. Because as they leave, God will continue to bring other people. But ultimately, your reward is waiting because when the work gets to the point where only the absolutely mature and reliable people can do the work, the Lord will bring them back. The Lord will bring the right people in and the work gets done. I am at the stage right now with Sister Power where God has just brought amazing, amazing, amazing skills, amazing, amazing gifts and they don't have to ask me questions. They know what to do and they are running with it. So God will call one man. Let me go through it again. And he will call all the men to that man. But if I will go on, it, uh, or if I will just quickly go to the end of verse number, verse number, da, 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 verse number seven, no, verse six. If I'll go to the end of verse number six, the reason why God has called you the first man and all the other men that he calls with you is so that you do, all of you will do what God has commanded. So I'll say that for a bit. Let me go back to Bezali. The point that I'm trying to make is that there is a designated team by God for the things that he's called you to. Everything that God has called you to he has a, designate, a designated group of people over the course of your lifetime and the course of the lifetime of that vision that he would manifest along the way to help you carry the load so that you are not overwhelmed by what God has called you to do. Here's what I'm saying. If God is the one that called you to do it, surely there is a man, there is a woman, there is a young man, there is a young woman somewhere who God is deposited what you need to do the carry out the next phase and the next phase and the next phase of what you are called to do. So if you are bizarrely the one that has been called to another man, just remain within the template of your gifting and remain within the parameters of your call to that man and you would have fulfilled destiny or fulfilled purpose as well. Do you understand this? So God will lead you to your team and sometimes it will be right where you are. Your team will not have to come from different places. Sometimes you have to pull them from different places. But most of the time, they are usually already hovering around you. And when they recognize their place, they feel it. Or when you make room for them so that they can see their place, they step in and they feel it. And your, the work that God has called you to begins to accelerate. In the mandate, this is where multiplication begins to happen in a rapidity that you, we did not even know could happen. So God will lead you to your team. Bezali was right where Moses was. So when the day came for Bezali to manifest, God announced him and Moses went to get him. Do you understand that so far? The second thing I see in verse 1 to 6 is that God started to describe Bezali to Moses. Number one. God said, I have filled him with the spirit of the Lord. God was the one that filled Bezali. He filled him first, not with skill. The first thing that every one of us should look for in a teammate is someone who has the spirit of God. The first thing and the most important qualification for teammates is that they have the spirit of God. If God is the one that has called you and he's the one that has assigned a task to you, you want to make sure that the people that you allow to step into the, into the room with you to build whatever God has called you to build are those that God has put his spirit upon. So Bezali, God had resourced Bezali with his spirit. He said, I have filled him with the spirit of God. God by himself filled Bezali with his spirit. Because of that, Bezali has the capacity to do the will of God. That's number one. Then he said, I have filled him with wisdom. I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and then in all manner of workmanship. The man that God would call to build with you, I'm praying that that's, those are the kinds of men that God will call to, or that, yes, he will call to you. 
and that you'll be able to recognize this man will be filled with the spirit of God. They will be steep in wisdom. They will have understanding and they will have knowledge. God does not just call. He also equips the one that he calls to us. What I found by again, by my own personal experience is that if I allow people to do what God has resourced them to do, they add more value to me than when I try to plug them into things that they are not good at doing. I have learned that lesson many times. I tend to forget that God does not fail to remind me that that is the way he operates. The young lady who came to see me this afternoon said to me, I like to do this thing with you. And the reason I like to do it with you, she couldn't quite put words to why. I had to say to them, because you have creative license. And she said, oh yes, that is the word for it. Because I let you express yourself. If Bezali was picked by Mo Moses when Moses just came in, and Moses decided to make Bezali a priest, there would have been a problem. But because God was the one that told Moses, Bezali is the one for this job, everything that Moses required, God gave it to him in Bezali to build. Does that make sense? God gave it to him to build. God gave him to build. And that is the way God calls us. And he brings men to us so that we, this men can help us do the things that he's called us to. So he called Bezali, filled him with the spirit of God, in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. If you notice the, the sequence, you will know that the skill, which is all manner of workmanship, was the least. It was the least of the credentials that Bezali had. It wasn't because it was not useful or it wasn't important, but it was because wisdom was more important than skill. Knowledge was more important than skill. Understanding in the spirit of God was more important than skill. If the man has the spirit of God, has wisdom, has knowledge, and has understanding, skill is the easiest thing for the man to pick up. I'm showing us credentials of how to choose our team. But more importantly, you ought to pray and say to God, lead me to the men and the women that you have called to build with me. So to excel in the work that God has called him to, God called him and equipped him. He called him and equipped him with his spirit. The spirit of God is the engine room for all our excellence and contribution. Then he called him and filled him with wisdom. Wisdom is the ability and the capacity to not just know what to do, but how to do it and when to do it. Because every man's call is about the future. Wisdom is how God empowers a man to deliver the future. A man that does not have wisdom would sparingly be able, <coughs> excuse me, would sparingly be able to deliver the future. So Bezali had wisdom, which meant that Bezali had the capacity to deliver the future that God wanted to create in building the tabernacle and the tent of meeting. Bezali had understanding as he was resourced by God, the ability to comprehend and make sense of the task that had been, he had been assigned to. Bezali wasn't just tongue speaking. He had capacity that made him useful. He could comprehend and make sense of the assignment and the task. Then Bezali had knowledge. Bezali had knowledge as endowed by God. And this was, and it wasn't just not the knowledge about the Bible only. It was knowledge that pertained to what God was going to use him for. In a nutshell, God would always take square pegs and pick them, put them in square holes. God makes sure. You see, those of you who have attended Pebbles University will understand what I'm saying. That there is something you have resourced with in your DNA, which we refer to as your first dominion, that God releases so that you can live in your last dominion or your final dominion. Do you understand that? So, 
After all of this spirit, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, God now put upon Bezali the skill or the anointing for all manner of workmanship. Bezali could work with wood. He could work with brass. He could work with gold. Whatever it is that needed to be fashioned, Bezali could do it. Why? Because the Lord God Almighty knew that Moses needed all of that to deliver on the assignment that he was going to be supervising. So he put it all in Bezali and manifested Bezali in, 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 um, in before Moses. And in the day when Bezali was required to be useful, God opened Moses' eyes to see Bezali and that meant that Moses brought Bezali in. That's number two. Number three, Bezali wasn't alone. He led the pack, no doubt. But God also called Aholiab to Bezali as well. Just as God called Bezali to Moses, he called Aholiab to Bezali. Then he called other gifted artisans. The point is, it wasn't an advertisement. Let me explain it to you. It was not the advertisement for the job that brought you to the job. The Bible says the steps of the righteous are ordered by God. You applied for the job and you got it because you are God's man for that place in God's season. In that season. It is not because you read, the, you went to the website of the church and you liked the feel of their worship and the word that you started to attend that church. The Bible says that the step of the righteous are ordered by God. You made it into that place because God led you to it. And so if God is the one that led you to these places, then what is expected is you would pay attention to the vision and you will contribute your quota. You will pay attention to the vision and you will contribute your quota. The principle of contribution is simply is seen here simply. A man is called, he's endowed, he's prepared, and he's deployed. A man is called, a man is called, he's endowed, he's prepared, and then he's deployed. Let me say it one more time. A man is called, he's endowed, he is prepared, and then he is deployed. God will not deploy a man that he did not endow. God will not deploy a man who has not been prepared. And definitely God is not going to deploy a man whom he has not called. Do you understand this? Bezali was therefore called and Aholiab was called to Bezali. And all the other artisans, gifted artisans were called. All of them to do one thing. The assignment was simple. From Moses to Aaron, to Aaron's sons, to Bezali, to Aholiab, and to all the gifted artisans, their assignment was simple. God called them for one reason and one reason alone, to do what he commanded Moses to do. That's why it does not make sense that God calls you into a team, and just because it's volunteer status, you got get there and you want to switch the vision around. The one who is at the head says, this is the vision that God has given me. You continue to tear it down. I'm not talking of adding value by suggestion. By everything he says, you say that's not the way it should be done. You want to own it and you want to run with it. God knew that you could own it and run with it. Yet he called you to this man. Does that make sense? If God calls you into a house, do not divide the vision. Make sure you keep it one and do exactly what God commanded your leader to do. If after a while it becomes a case of you are not sure your leader can hear God anymore, your job is to go to God and he would either redeploy you or he by himself would move your leader out of the way. It is not your job to pray and say that God should sack someone because he doesn't know what he's doing so that you can take their place. That's not the way God promotes. Does this make sense? Let me go on. If we follow this model that we see in Exodus 31, we see how our teams ought to function. One man receives the vision from God. Then the man says the vision to the others. 
They buy into the vision because God has called them individually. And then they build what exactly what God showed the one man that he first called. The key, like I said, is not to engage in that vision. And in Exodus, we saw it happen. When in, I think it's actually in the next chapter, when Aaron decided to build a golden calf, decided to begin to determine who should be worshipped and how that person should be worshipped, it ended in a calamity. We saw it when Aaron's sons started to um, offer sacrifices and bring that they were not supposed to offer. God called it strange fire. The point I'm making is that when there is a team, God always has someone in charge. The man doesn't need to be as gifted as Bezali. <laughs> he doesn't need to be an orator like Aaron. He could start her from here to next tomorrow. But if he's the one that God has picked to be the one that will receive the vision, then he's the one that all of us should follow so that we can all arrive where God has called us to. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, the Bible says it like this. It says, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord and not unto men. So when you find yourself in a team, what is your responsibility? Give it your best. Listen to the vision of the one who, is, who God has called and God has called you to. Interpret it within the, the parameters of your, skill, of your skill and your talent or your ability as much as you can. But make sure you never deviate from the vision. God said to Moses many times, he said, do exactly as I said. He said, I have called this men to you so that they will do as I have commanded. The workmen could not alter the design. Because it was not their place to do. Does that make sense? Let me read verse 7 to 11. In verse 7 it says, And the tabernacle of the congregation and the ark of the testimony and the mercy seat that is therein and the furniture of the tabernacle and the table and his furniture and the pure candlestick and with all his furniture and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering with all his furniture and the lover and his foot, and the clothes of service, and the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments for his sons, to minister in the priest's office, and in the anointing oil, and in the, and the anointing oil and sweet, sweet incense for the holy place, according to all that I have commanded thee, shall they do. Moses receives the command, they do. The Lord listed what they should build. They will build the tabernacle of meeting, the ark of the testimony, the mercy seat, the furniture of the tabernacle, the pure gold lampstands, the candlesticks, everything, the garments for ministry, everything that needed to be done will be built and built will be built by these artisans. But they will only be built according to how God has commanded Moses. When God calls a man, and he builds a team around that man, there is a pattern. Leaders who don't ask God what the pattern is are leaders who fail God. Every one of us, I keep saying it, is not because they called you and you heard the call, you zoom out and you begin to run. There is a place for understanding the, the instructions that you have. There is a place for asking for the pattern according to which it will build. There is a place for understanding how God wants it to be done. So that when you begin to do it, you don't find yourself doing it wrongly or doing it a, um, contrary to the pattern that God has called, uh, God had, had ordained. That means that you also must be in a place, pay attention to me, you must also be able to sell the vision to those that God has called to you as members of your team so that they can understand the vision and they can run with it. In the book of Habakkuk, God said it like this. It says the vision is for an appointed time. Write it down and make it plain. It cannot be convoluted. It cannot be confusing. The ones that work with you must understand where you are headed. 
put them put it in bullet points if necessary or if possible so that the moment they see it they know what their place is and they can help you actualize what it is that needs to be done there is a pattern this pattern can't be switched god said to moses according to all that i have commanded you this pattern can't be tweaked if it is not going to If it, is, if it is going to change the outlook of what God wants to do, we cannot agree that the pattern should be tweaked. Does that make sense? When you take a look at it, you understand why as New Testament priests today, our office is critical, extremely critical and important to the manifestation of the finished work of Jesus. The one who has received the vision must learn to hear and receive from God for the others in order to deliver on God's vision. That means that you have to keep um, sharing and resharing the vision so that they can catch it, they can see it. That's why it is good to be able to say it in such a way that it paint, it formulates pictures in the, uh, uh, in the minds of the ones that are listening to you. And then beyond that is allow them to ask you questions to understand. Now someone will be like, Sister B has it together. Not always, but this is the pattern regardless. In verse 12 to 17, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know sanctify you shall keep the sabbath therefore for it is holy unto you everyone that defile it, it shall surely be put to death for whosoever doeth any work therein that so shall be cut off from among his people six days may work be done but in the seventh is the sabbath holy to the lord whosoever doth doeth any work in the sabbath he shall surely be put to death wherefore the children of israel shall keep the sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. Pay attention to me. There was Moses who received the vision. There were Aaron and his sons who were the priesthood. There's Bezalia, Holiab, and the Assyrians who built the temple. And they are the children of Israel. They are, their instruction was not hard though. Their instruction was simple. Rest on the Sabbath day. Even that instruction, they failed. God did not take the multitude of the children of Israel and say to them, all of you, go pick Haman's are built. They were designated people for designated roles on this journey that God was taking the people of Israel through. And this brings me to the last part of today's teaching, which had to do with rest. If you remember, first note that the instruction to keep the Sabbath was after the instruction to build. The instruction to keep the uh, keep Sabbath was after the instruction to build. After God has spoke to those ones who will build, he told the rest of them, he said, do their work. There will be different things that you will need to do. But on the seventh day, which was a Sabbath day, make sure you rest. God was so, 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 so serious about the Sabbath day that he said that whoever didn't keep it would die. Whoever was caught walking on the Sabbath day will be put to death. Today in the new covenant, we no longer observe specific Sabbath days like that. There is no punishment for walking on a Sunday. But there is a punishment for not walking out of rest. You'll be like, what's the punishment? It shows in your body. It shows in your attitude. It shows in your capacity to deliver what God has called you to do. If you remember when we looked at the book of Genesis... In chapter 2, we talked about um, we talked about the fact that God ceased from his work. And from that point on, the first thing that God modeled to man was God, man, God, man saw God at rest. God was at rest before God showed man what to work, how to work. God is told Aholiab and Belahaz, Bezali and Moses and everybody what they needed to do. Now God is saying that the best way to build, pay attention to me, is to build out of rest. You don't rest for building. You build from rest. You don't labor from, 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 it's not that you don't do any work. Rest is not inactivity. 
Rest is the capacity to see God on the throne and recognize that he's the one that is carrying you to deliver on what he's called you to do. So there will be a man who is juggling 15 things for God. But if, it has, if he's at rest, that means that he has this peace on the inside of him. He will not make any mistakes. He will not be overwhelmed. Show me when I begin to uh, pull my hair. And I can tell you, or if you find me when I'm pulling my hair, you don't need to look far. far. I am not at rest. I'm worried in my spirit. As long as I'm at rest, the lines fall together for me in pleasant places. As long as I'm at, I'm at, as I'm, as I'm at rest, the people that we build with me will show up. As long as I'm not fretting, whoever has the skill that I require in the season will show up. And even when the person has not showed up, maybe because they've not heard the trumpet of God to show up, if I'm at rest, I will not make mistakes. Do you understand this? In our days, Rest is not a day that you take off. Rest is predominantly a posture and a state of the mind. God wants us to build for him, number one. He wants us to build by teams or in teams, number two. He calls one man, he gives him the vision, he calls the rest of us to that man, number three. As we begin to build, there is a pattern and we must not deviate from that pattern no matter what is happening, number four. Before we begin to build, let it be that our posture is of rest. Because when you build, some days you would have a shortage of material. When you build, some days the man that was supposed to do X, Y, Z for you will not show up on time. Sometimes when you build, when you have worked and worked, you will fall ill. Sometimes money will be tight. Sometimes your teams will have quarrels and arguments. If you are a man who is not building from rest... You can be sure that you won't be able to deliver. God was very vehement about resting. But like I said, it's not about the Sabbath day and what you will not do. This is more about what you can do, how you can do, or the posture you must adapt and adopt, adopt so that you can deliver on what God has called you to do. As I begin to round off Exodus chapter 31, Verse 17 says, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. That is rest, the posture of rest. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tablets of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. We are entering the... As we move on, we will see Moses show up with the physical tablets that had the Ten Commandments written on them. But before the Ten Commandments would manifest that the men and the women could read to follow, God already assigned them to a place of peace and a place of rest. This is very instructive for me because I just finished um, the manuscript on the Ten Commandments, the book that I'm writing. And um, I was, as I was rounding off, I brought the roundup to the place of Jesus. I moved away from the law and I brought it to grace. To say when you understand the sacrifice of Jesus and his place in your life, it will be easy to be able to do what? Follow the Ten Commandments and not feel like someone has something on you. What does that mean? It is part of rest because in Christ we are at rest. That's why in Hebrews chapter 4 it says labor to enter into the rest. The rest is not a seizure from work, the, a, a, a season from work. The rest is to be in that place where God's hand is upon us. And because we know that his hand, is, his hand is upon us, no matter what the vision is, no matter what it is that he's called us to build with him, no matter how long it's going to take, no matter how expensive or how costly it's going to be, we can follow God step after step after step after step until we arrive at the place where we finish building that which he's called us to. Exodus 33, 31, therefore, is an account of how God calls a man, and he doesn't leave the man alone. 
He calls the man, and as the man progresses in his work with him, every step of the way, whatever the man needs, God is domiciled it in another man, and he will manifest that man in time. As we go on, you will see Joshua, when God decided to groom Joshua, so that Joshua becomes the one who takes over from, um, what's his name, from Moses when the time was right. The point is that when God calls us to build, he doesn't leave vacuums. If someone who is supposed to build with you has not manifested, go to God in prayer and continue to ask him, Lord, where are the Aholiabs? Where are the Bezalis? Where are the gifted artisans that you have assigned to this dream that you've put in my heart? As you begin to pray that, also ask him to prepare you to be the kind of leader that people would be willing to follow. That is never easy. But as we grow, all of us, in our rough edges will be some papered off by the washing of the water by the word. And after a while, people find it easy to work with us. And because of that, we are able to deliver on God's, the dream of God's heart that he's translated or transmitted into our hearts and our spirit. Brethren, when you are the number two or the number four, Remember that what it is that you are contributing is just as important as what the set man has. Unless you carry your, your part of the vision well, the set man may not um, be able to complete his race. And if the set man is not able to complete his race, it is not just his failure, it is also your failure because you were called to the set man. I'm hoping that this makes sense and you understand what it is that God is trying to do with us. When we come tomorrow, um, next week, if Jesus tarries, we'll be looking at Exodus 32. We will see how Aaron built the golden calf because Moses was taking uh, um, too much time up on the mountain when God was talking to him. And we'll take a look at the consequence and we'll take a look at why that was put in between Exodus 31 and Exodus 33. Thank you so much for joining us. If you're on this um, broadcast this evening and you have not given your life to Jesus, you need to give your life to Jesus. This is not just about building teams and excelling in the things that God has called us to do. This is about building teams in, in, in God's kingdom. This is how God works with his people. This is the template. And you have to have a relationship with God to be able to find yourself, your place within the kingdom to deliver what God has called you to. So if you have not um, given your life to Jesus and maybe you stumbled on this prayer call, on this um. This broadcast this evening has been the study of Exodus 31, and you can join us every Wednesday at 7 p.m. But before we get to next Wednesday, how about you give your life to Jesus this evening? Say with me, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Before I leave, I want to say to you, um, if you're saying that with me this evening, please type it in the comments. We would like to rejoice with you. Before I like to leave, I want to remind you again, every one of us, our contribution is significant. None of us is insignificant in the scheme of the things that God has called us to build. And no, number one is not better than number two. Number two is not better than number six. What has happened is that we are all unique and we are different. And God has called us and put us in a team. He won't bring number four when number one has not done his work. You need to recognize that if you are number one, when you do your work properly, number two will be able to do his work. When number two does his work properly, number three will be able to do his work. If number three does well, number four and five and six and seven and so on and so forth will be able to do their work. But no matter where you hold in this work, remember, we are supposed to build according to pattern and we are supposed to do everything that God has commanded the set man. Thank you so much for joining the, uh, the, the broadcast this evening. If Jesus Star is next week, Wednesday, we will come and take a look at Exodus, um, Exodus 32. Thank you again and God bless you. Have a good night. And bye-bye.